skill sets, different ways of writing, different ways of going about doing science. And I think that's incredibly difficult. Um, the reason I mentioned that this is one of the first people I advised is because it's most difficult. It's difficult enough that I'm not sure that I would advise somebody else to do it again. Um, but she did an exceptional job on it. And to come through that uh, you know, on time with uh, the work she did is, is really phenomenal. And she handled the logistics fantastically for it. And she demonstrated a capacity to learn how to learn which is something that I think is really central to the core of a doctorate of philosophy and of getting a PhD. So i um, very proud of Diana and very happy to uh, introduce you to her today. Thank you very much, Ed. I am going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Hopefully. Can you guys just see the um, main title page? Okay, sweet. Awesome. Well, um, today I'm just gonna give a brief overview of my dissertation. Um, it's sort of an adaptive, uh, adapted version of my dissertation defense. Um, so my dissertation focused on developing decision support tools for socioecological systems using the Florida Stock Enhanced Freshwater Recreational Fisheries as a case study. Oh goodness, here we go. There we go. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, socioecological systems um, are very complex, but typically you sort of have three sort of different categories. On the left in green, we have the resource system and the resource unit. And on the right in blue, we have the governance system and the actors. And then in the middle that helps interact all of these parts of the socioecological system, we sort of have the actions that can be used in managing these natural systems. In my dissertation, we focused on the aquatic system and the fish in green. And on the right in blue, we have the Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission or FWC. You'll hear me use that acronym uh, with some frequency. And then we have the anglers in blue. And the main action that we're focused on is stock enhancement. So stock enhancement or stocking is the release of cultured organisms into natural systems. And in Florida, we have two main major hatcheries. So that's where the fish are really grown. Um, and those two hatcheries uh, account for about 60 acres of grout space. You can see here some drone footage of the largest hatchery, the Florida Bass Conservation Center. Um, and in both of these combined hatcheries, we su support the uh, growth and production of the species on the right. So as you can see, there are a number of different species, um, including some of the main target species in freshwater fishing within Florida. Here are two different potential methods for actual stock enhancement of getting the fish from the hatchery into the water bodies. Um, and those are probably the more frequent uh, methods that are used in Florida. Stocking is typically conducted to enhance, restore, or conserve a population. And as you can guess, we are really focused on the enhancement aspect in this dissertation. So my goal was to develop tools to support more informed stock enhancement decision-making, specifically in the management of Florida freshwater recreational fisheries. So I have three main questions. I will go through them here, and then they'll pop up as I go through each of my uh, chapters. My first one is how does centrality of lifestyle affect anglers and their view of stocking? What species do anglers prefer to be stocked? And what management actions do anglers prefer? And I answered these questions using a survey. My second question was how can stocking support multiple socioeconomic objectives across a heterogeneous landscape? And I used a simulation model to answer this question. My third and final question is how can stocking management objectives be balanced within hatchery capacity? And I used an optimization model for uh, to answer that question. So those are my three questions. My first chapter, commitment of freshwater anglers and its relation to their preferences for stocking and other management actions. As you just saw, my first research question has to do with centrality to lifestyle and how anglers view stocking, their species preferences for being stocked and their management action. Uh, preferences. And I answered this using a survey. Just to give you some realm of reference, given what we talked about to start with in terms of our socioecological systems, we're really interested here in the stock enhancement and angler uh, feedback system. So our freshwater uh, recreational anglers 
or just recreational anglers in general, we really want them to be satisfied because they are essential to the fishery. In a recreational fishery, if anglers are not satisfied and they leave the fishery, the fishery will basically not exist anymore. So we need to make sure that anglers are really satisfied. And anglers can have a diverse set of special specializations. And that can be anywhere from skill level to species preferences um, and things like that. Here we wanna focus on centrality to lifestyle. So centrality to lifestyle is really a metric of how much uh, time people spend of their total leisure time fishing. So somebody who's on the higher end of, uh, in terms of levels of centrality to lifestyle or commitment, you might see that as well, um, might spend um, the vast majority of their leisure time fishing. Most of their friends are, um, made through either angling clubs or most of the time they spend with friends is fishing. Whereas somebody who's less committed or has a lower level of centrality to lifestyle when it comes to fishing may go like once a year, maybe once every few months. It's just not really a huge part of their leisure time or they don't choose to spend much of their leisure time fishing. And the Previous studies that have focused on centrality to lifestyle have primarily been done with warm water species, specifically in Germany. So this uh, project really presents a unique opportunity and uh, a novel opportunity to really understand anglers in war with warm water species. So our survey um, about angler preferences for stocking was sent to about 230,000 Florida resident freshwater anglers, and we had a response rate of about 5.3%. So I analyzed responses from just over 12,000 anglers. And to get to our uh, lifestyle or um, centrality to lifestyle question, we had nine questions that anglers answered about their commitment to fishing. And then we can't categorize their respondents um, into the participants into three different commitment levels. So our committed is this, the group that really spends most of their uh, leisure time fishing. So that's 28.7% of our uh, participants, then we had active, which was our larger group, which makes the most largest group, which makes the most sense at about 43%. And we had casual anglers um, who, those are the ones that are spending like maybe once a year to once every few months um, fishing. So those are the more casual anglers. So getting into our questions, the first one was how do anglers view stocking? And you can see pretty clearly here, um, we have the committed on the left, active, so that's our middle group in the middle, and casual, so the least committed group on the right. We see here pretty quickly that well over 50% of all three of these categories have an extremely positive uh, or extremely or somewhat positive view of stocking. So those two darkest blues that you see are both positive responses to stocking. Um, and you also see at the bottom, the lightest blue, two lightest blue colors, you can basically uh, not even tell the difference at the bottom um, are, are negative responses. And that's well under 5% um, of our respondents. However, um, ultimately we found that there was really no significant difference between our angler categories. So our, life, uh, our centrality of lifestyle um, sort of categorization didn't actually result in any uh, statistically significant differences between these three groups. So as we go forward to answer the next two questions, you'll see the answers aggregated into a single answer. So our next question was um, how do anglers, what or what do anglers prefer in terms of stocking of specific species? On the left, you have the proportion um, on the y-axis and on the x-axis, you have from left to right, largemouth bass, panfish, catfish, striped bass, and no stocking. And each of the greens, um, you have the darkest green is ranked one and the lightest green ranked number five. And the first thing to note is we see that over 75% of our respondents actually preferred um, stocking of any of these species over no stocking at all. So that just confirms our original, uh, the original graph you saw where anglers strongly preferred stocking or strongly, uh, strongly had, a, had a strongly positive view of stocking, excuse me. Um, the next thing to note is that largemouth bass is clearly sort of the front runner here in terms of preference. We also see that panfish is a pretty close second. And then finally, we have catfish and striped bass categories being much lower compared to the other two. And then again, we have a similar graph here, proportion of respondents on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we actually broke up the largemouth bass. Um, so we have catchable largemouth bass, fingerling largemouth bass, so much smaller. 
uh, panfish, catfish, striped back, bass, and then our last two um, to include in our management preferences uh, question is habitat maintenance and facility maintenance. So um, here we're focused on uh, management actions and we wanted to include stocking in that to see where it might line up with other potential um, management actions. And again, we ranked them. So the top rank is the darkest green and the lowest rank is the lightest green. So first we see that habitat management of these categories is definitely sort of the front runner. Uh, anglers definitely preferred habitat maintenance and improvement over um, other stocking options or even maintenance of facilities. We also see that catch, uh, catchable and fingerling largemouth bass are definitely second um, to habitat. And then finally, we also see, um, as we saw before, catfish and striped bass are low, but we also honestly somewhat surprisingly saw that facilities were on the lower end as well. So back to our research questions, just as a reminder, we were interested in how anglers view stocking, what species anglers preferred to be stocked, and what management actions anglers preferred. Overall, we saw these results regardless of centrality to lifestyle, but we saw that anglers had a positive view of stocking. They really overwhelmingly supported stocking. Um, we saw that largemouth bass was a strong preference followed by panfish, but sort of much a little more further away with striped bass and catfish. So there was definitely a section of people of respondents that preferred striped bass and catfish over the other species, but that was a lower um, percentage than the other two. And then finally, we saw that uh, habitat management was preferred over uh, stocking or stocking of any species, but it was followed pretty closely by largemouth bass stocking. And so our management implications overall I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but anglers really strongly support stocking um, and that might in turn really support angler satisfaction. So that gets back to wanting to maintain this recreational fishery. We wanna make sure that anglers are happy and if they like stocking, that is something that we should strongly consider doing when it comes to management. Finally, uh, or the final two points are um, largemouth bass and panfish really have strong support among anglers. And if you're choosing to stock, um, managers might consider integrating habitat management into their plan for stocking, because not only does that support fish, it also was clearly a preference for anglers as well. So um, that might be uh, a management action that can be considered um, in tandem with stocking. So we saw that largemouth bass has a really strong preference uh, or anglers have really strong preference for largemouth bass. And so just prioritizing star stocking largemouth bass really make a lot of sense. So our second chapter is stock and spatial planning. planning. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. um, um, I'm getting um, feedback from yeah. somebody, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you're in line, you could mute yourself unless you're Diana, that would probably be good. I will keep going. Um, examining trade-offs in largemouth bass recreational fisheries. Um, here we go. Thank you. Um, how can stocking support, again, so getting back to our questions, how can stocking support multiple socioeconomic objectives across a heterogeneous landscape? Um, and I would answer this question using a simulation model. So again, trying to give you some uh, framework to reference in terms of where this question is really focused on. We're really interested in the aquatic system, the fish, and how stock enhancement might uh, impact that. Um, a little bit of background, the largemouth bass fishery contributes substantially to the economy in Florida. It contributes millions and millions of dollars every single year to the um, local economy within Florida. And as you saw in the first chapter, um, but we also um, want to maintain that we satisfied anglers are key for recreational fisheries. Um, and that's clearly largemouth bass is clearly a pr strong preference for recreational fisheries. And then finally, there are trade-offs in recreational fisheries um, that are inherently there. One of them for uh, this particular fishery that might be a little bit more unique is uh, catch rate and trophy catch. So we have these uh, sport fishermen that really want to get these trophy catch fish or trophy size fish, which are eight pounds or above, I believe. And then, um, but we also have a number of anglers that are, would be super happy just catching multiple fish that are sort of a medium size. So we need to be able to balance that in the population dynamics as we're considering stocking as a management action. So in my model, we had a number of different input variables and response variables um, or response metrics. 
Uh, our input variables that of note are spatial distribution, angler movement, habitat suitability, stocking level, and length of stocking, uh, links at stocking, so the what size were the fish when they were stocked. And our response metrics vulnerable, include vulnerable number of vulnerable fish, angler utility, wild biomass, catch per unit effort, and trophy catch. And just as a reminder, we're really going to focus on catch per unit effort. Um, you might see a um, acronym CPUE, the catch per unit effort and trophy catch um, are the two that we'll be focusing on. So in terms of the model, we have a spatial model. We have um, a population center on the left. We have five identical lakes that are each slightly further away from that population center. In each of these lakes, we have a fish um, sort of a fish population model. So we have our wild fish, we have our stocked fish that come directly from the hatchery. And then we have our hatchery fish, fish, which are actually our hatchery type fish. They are the offspring of two stocked fish or one wild and one stocked fish. Um, they all, all three of these distinct uh, populations uh, within the lake contribute to recruitment of the entire species and they age as the model continues and we have, they each contribute again to the, at the end to total abundance of vulnerable fish, angler satisfaction and total fishing effort among others of our um, response metrics. So you'll see this um, example moving forward and then we'll switch around a little bit, but just so you guys know the outline of each of these lakes indicates the ha habitat suitability for the species. So here we have the lake closest to the population center in red, so it's the most degraded, then we get slightly further away um, and it gets slightly better. So in this particular example, the two green lakes have pristine habitat for uh, recruitment. Um, but in this model, we could change that uh, habitat suitability depending on what situation we were looking at. Um, and then we could also stock any of these lakes. In this particular example, we are choosing to stock these three lakes um, and we can choose to stock more fish or fewer fish um, as well. And then finally, we have length at stocking. We can, we in the first, in the previous slide, you could see that the fish were smaller and now we have slightly larger fish. Um, and so that could be a choice um, that we could make as the inputs of this uh, model as well. So as I said, we were focusing on trophy catch and catch per unit effort. Here we have it by lake. You just saw this example at the top where the lake closest to the city is the most degraded and the lake furthest from the city uh, is pristine. Here, both greens are pristine. Um, I just wanted you to see that you'll see in a moment the graph. Um, so you, each line in the graph indicates um, a particular lake here. Um, and so here we have trophy catch on the left, catch per unit effort on the right. Stocking starts at year 30, so that uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 is years. Um, and each of these colored lines in, is uh, representative of the lake with that color up top. And sort of three takeaways here we see on trophy catch, um, we have two, we have a brief increase and then a dramatic, a relatively dramatic decrease. And then on the right for catch per unit effort, we see an increase once stocking starts and it's sustained over time. Here at the top, we change that scenario a little bit. We have the pristine, two pristine lakes closest to the city and we have slightly degraded lakes as we get further and further away. And we chose to stock the lake closest to the city. And here we have the same types of trends, um, but this is really important. So again, we have the brief increase in the dramatic decrease, and we have the sustained increase for catch per unit effort. But here we see that the metrics of trophy catch and catch per unit effort actually rises above the lake that is slightly further away from the city, um, even though, as you can see before stocking, those metrics were lower than that lake. So that's something to consider um, for managers as they move forward with uh, considering stocking. Here we are looking at um, these metrics across the landscape. So we're looking at um, trophy catch here, um, but across the landscape. On the left, we have degraded city habitat. So that habitat scenario is up top. And then we have the degraded rural habitat on the right. And that's also noted up top. These lines um, are indica indicative of the number of lakes that are stocked. So the black is sort of our baseline no stocking scenario. Our orange is all five lakes are stocked. The green is three different scenarios stocking three lakes and the blue are um, 
or sorry, two two scenarios with three lakes stocked, and on that, well, two the three blue ones are three scenarios with a single lake stocked. Um, the first thing that pops out, um, we want trophy catch to increase, and this is these are two potential areas where um, trophy catch did increase with the the degraded habitat. Um, and as I mentioned, we have sort of that grouping of lakes, so we see a more dramatic decrease in trophy catch over time as more lakes are stocked. Um, but if you only stock a single lake, we see that um, that dramatic decrease is less. However, if you look at the start of stocking, that dramatic increase increase of trophy catch is less as well. So that's something, it's a trade-off to consider. Um, and then finally, you might not have noticed this, but the initial starting uh, point for trophy catch um, in both of these scenarios is actually slightly different. Um, and that's simply due to the habitat differences over the landscape. When we look at catch per unit effort uh, over the landscape, um, we have the same set of degraded city habitat and degraded rural habitat scenarios with the same uh, stocking scenarios. Um, but the first thing to note is that the y-axis is actually pretty small. Um, so this impact on catch per unit effort is ultimately pretty small compared to um, that impact on trophy catch. We again have that grouping. So all lakes in orange, three uh, all lakes stocked in orange, three lakes stocked in green, and one lake stocked in blue. Um, and this is the important takeaway from the set of graphs is that when you are stocking the lake that is the most highly degraded, you actually see the catch per unit effort increase the most dramatically. So on the left-hand graph, the bright green is um, indicative of the three lakes that are degraded being stocked. And you see that that catch per unit effort parallels is almost very close to stocking all five lakes. You see the same thing with um, the degraded rural habitat habitat as well. And again, you see this difference, it's more stark in this these graphs than the previous one. These are simply due to the habitat differences across the landscape. So again, our research question is how can stocking support multiple socioeconomic objectives across a heterogeneous landscape? Um, we see that larger fish make a larger impact on our management objectives. So stocking larger fish um, would be sort of better depending on what our management objectives might be. We see, as you just saw in the last couple graphs, stocking in degraded habitat um, actually uh, leads, allows us to um, accomplish specific manage, manage, management objectives a little bit better. Um, simply because degraded habitat leaves sort of room for improvement um, through stocking. Um, and then finally, we wanna make sure that we're stocking spatially. We wanna make sure we're evaluating our objectives across the landscape, not just a single lake. Um, and I will get that back to that in just a second. So in Florida, we might consider uh, stocking larger fish. However, it does require more hatchery space. So that's something uh, of a trade-off that we have to um, balance when it comes to management, at least in Florida. And as we sort of saw, especially with CPUE, there are somewhat limited benefits even with larger fish. And then finally, overall with recreational fisheries, we found that uh, ultimately, only specific scenarios show benefits um, for these particular objectives that we were evaluating. And ultimately, we also do want to evaluate over a landscape um, to support more objectives. So we're not, rarely would you find a moment where managers are specifically stocking uh, a single lake sort of in a vacuum. We want to make sure that we have um, a larger overview of what is being stocked. So Florida is a great example. We have thousands of lakes and thousands of um, miles of uh, creek and riverfronts. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are really looking across the landscape to understand how stocking, particularly in this particular moment, um, is going to impact that across the landscape. So in one lake, we might choose to really focus on habitat management and that will have satisfied some anglers, whereas we might really go hard on stocking largemouth bass in another lake um, and that would satisfy another set of anglers. Um, and so being able to use different water bodies to be able to satisfy different types of uh, anglers is really important when we are uh, choosing to manage recreational fisheries. So sort of mentioned this a little bit, what should hatcheries actually produce? 
So my third chapter was stocking optimization, balancing management objectives in fisheries stock enhancement. Um, getting back to the questions, how can stocking management objectives be balanced within our hatchery capacity? I used an optimization to answer this question. And again, we're getting back to this sort of framework. We have FWC, anglers, and uh, sort of stock enhancement, our action. How do we manage this uh, particular decision in terms of stock enhancement? As I mentioned, we have two hatcheries. Um, there is about 60 acres of grow out space. And we have really, really strong support from anglers. As you saw, we stock a number of different species and generally managers really support stocking as well. But we really are limited by 60 acre, by that 60 acres. It might sound like a lot, but um, when you really think about all of the potential places that uh, stocking could happen in Florida, given the um, large number of lakes uh, and rivers that we have, that is quite limiting. So the really, the question is, um, how do we fit all of these um, priorities, both from anglers as well as managers into the space within the hatchery? So I used a knapsack problem. This is just an example. You can imagine that you're going backpacking. You have a number of different items that you want to bring with you, but your backpack only carries 25 kilograms uh, of weight. And so you wanna make sure that you are somehow prioritizing the items that you have so that you can sort of survive your day hike or backpacking uh, trip um, to like basically increase your probability of survival. So you wanna make sure that your survival points are as high as possible, but you can't uh, go beyond the capacity of your backpack. So when we adapt, to, adapt this to the hatchery, we have all of our different species. Our species takes up, take up a number of acres um, and we need to figure out what that value is to be able to uh, fit all of those species into the uh, capacity of the hatchery. So our rearing priorities are ultimately determined by our uh, items that each have a space and value associated with them. And the value here is what we're really interested in. And that, that is determined both by angler priorities and manager priorities. And I was really interested in how we might uh, weight each of those values. So here we have A and M as sort of a uh, weighting system to determine the value of each item. So don't worry about reading this. The main point here is that there are a ton of different stocking options or stocking items. They're just looking at largemouth bass. We have three different phases. So those are three different sizes of the uh, largemouth bass that have the potential to be stocked. They have acres, which can also be translated into the number of fish. Um, I have that here because oftentimes managers want to know how many fish they're able to stock as opposed to just the number of acres. And then finally, we really want to ultimately figure out what the value is. So to do that, um, as some of you might have guessed, I am using my results from my first chapter, um, looking at participants. So that's the angler view of various species. So we really have species categories here. Again, we have largemouth bass, panfish, catfish, and striped bass. And so that I use that to determine the angler value of each of the stocking items. And then I also sent out um, sort of that giant spreadsheet that you just saw to a number of different managers. I think I ended up getting close to 20 or 25 uh, managers to respond to uh, assigning values to each of the stocking items. And I used those to determine manager values of each stocking item. So again, back to our knapsack uh, adaptation, our value is then put back into our rearing priorities or into our items so we can determine our rearing priorities. So I ran a principal coordinate analysis. Um, here we have anglers in green, managers in blue, and are balanced in orange. And I mean balanced by uh, that weighting system. So it was 50% angler uh, uh, values and 50% manager values. We can see that that obviously overlaps pretty significantly with both anglers and managers. Um, and we see some overlap uh, of anglers and managers as well, but it's interesting to see that there is um, a bunch of space sort of on our principal coordinate analysis that you see that they're not overlapped very much either. So digging into that a little bit more, um, we're looking at each of the five management regions here. So we have anglers in pink, the balanced, again, that's 50-50 in purple. Um, and then each of the management regions, so I had managers that uh, uh, manage each of those regions respond to my sort of item list. Um, and 
I was able to run the principal coordinate analysis with those as well. And each of the colors in this PCOA respond, corresponds to the management region on the map in the top right. So the first thing to note, which is pretty obvious, we see that the Southwest managers um, don't really overlap at all with either the managers or the anglers. Um, next, we see that there's pretty significant overlap with both the North Central and the Northeast managers. And um, we also see that there's pretty significant overlap with the managers from the South region as well. And then finally, we see that the Northwest managers have probably the most overlap with um, the overall anglers. Oh, finally, we're getting to sort of the optimized stocking items. On the left, we have the items that occur in every single scenario that I ran, and then items that occur in most scenarios, so 80 to 99% of the scenarios. The first thing to note is that the items that occur in every scenario are pretty much all have a low relative stocking level, um, except for bluegill, but um, you will see in the most scenarios, if we go over here, that if we expand that to most scenarios, we see a wider range of relative stocking levels. So we have low, moderate, and then one high for bluegill as well. And then finally, I think it's important to note, you see that catfish has two relative stocking levels low that occur in every scenario, but you don't see any catfish at all in the occurs in most scenarios. Um, and I think that's just really uh, telling in terms of priorities. Like, yes, we can have a low number of uh, catfish, but ultimately we don't really uh, see much of a priority either from anglers or from uh, managers. So again, our research question is how can stocking management uh, objectives be balanced within a hatchery capacity? We see our conclusions ultimately are uh, that largemouth bass and panfish species are a high priority and that's determined both by angler uh, preferences, but also manager preferences. And then as I mentioned, catfish seem to be a relatively overall limited priority. Yes, we have low numbers, but ultimately we don't actually see them pop up that much more in other scenarios. Um, and there are some pretty um, distinct regional preferences for the Southwest region, but generally they're not that different. We see that the North Central and the Northeast are very, very similar. In terms of management implications, we see that this method identifies consistent and sometimes less consistent stocking items. We um, It identifies points for potential collaboration between management regions so that North Central and Northeast uh, region can really potentially work together to identify what they might wanna stock um, in the years to come. And But it also ultimately illustrates the need for manager judgment. We can't just sort of plug and play, so to speak, in terms of what our priorities are for both managers or um, anglers. We really need to be able to have a sort of human judgment, the manager judgment, being able to say, okay, we should really do this. This is what this says, but maybe we like nuance it a little bit so that we can have um, sort of a broader range of what's stocked or not, depending on the year. So what does this all mean? So again, these were our research questions. The first one was how does centrality of lifestyle affect how anglers view stocking? How, uh, what species anglers prefer to be stocked and what management actions anglers prefer? We ultimately saw that anglers view stocking positively. They strongly prefer largemouth bass and they support habitat management followed pretty closely by largemouth bass stocking. Ultimately, we see anglers support stocking and habitat management, but if we're gonna choose to stock, largemouth bass and panfish are the best choices. Our second question was how can stocking support multiple socioeconomic objectives across a heterogeneous landscape? We see that to support trophy catch and uh, catch per unit effort or catch rate, stocking can be used in very specific scenarios um, and stocking larger fish and in degraded habitat is typically best, but there are ultimately very limited benefits. And our final question, how can stocking management objectives be balanced within a hatchery capacity? Um, when deciding between large numbers or large uh, sizes of popular fish, it's more difficult than uh, to do that than identifying low numbers of less popular fish, which makes sense. Rearing fewer fish of more species and larger fish, is, larger fish addresses multiple objectives best. Overall, um, if I were to sum up sort of the results of my um, dissertation, anglers have strong preferences around stocking, which may not have the largest impact on management objectives. Explicitly identifying stocking items that support management objectives may lead to a greater positive impact for the fisheries.
So these tools support more informed stock enhancement, recreational fisheries, uh, management decision-making. Um, and I'd like to thank my committee as well as my funding sources, the School of Natural Resources and Environment, the School of Forest Fisheries and Geomatic Sciences and FWC. Obviously, thanks to my committee members, uh, very strong thank you to Zach Siders who helped me determine the best model for my results of my survey, as well as Lisa Chong who helped me with uh, a bunch of the modeling. Um, FWC was obviously very um, important to this project. And so help from the RFAs, hatchery managers, and Jason Dodson were um, really important to the success of this project, as well as the Camp Lab, the Keen Lunch Group, and my family and friends. So with that, I will take any questions. I saw a hand from Jason. Hey, thank you for that talk. That was interesting. That's a lot of data. Um, I had a question about your metrics for degraded habitat or how you defined degraded mm -hmm. habitat. I wondered if that had to do any um, with trophic state and whether you saw, I guess, if there were any either enhancing or conflicting variables that, that gave you the result that you did, that you found. So we, um, for... Uh, degraded habitat, we basically just de decreased recruitment of the wild population um, for those particular, I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second and I will reshare it if I need to. Um, I So we basically just did it as a percent of the wild population recruitment. So for example, like mildly degraded habitat was um, like 95% of degraded, uh, of uh, pristine recruitment. Um, and then like, if we did extreme, we, we ultimately we found that um, decreases in recruitment. So i.e. the uh, metric for habitat quality um, had the most dramatic effect on um, the sort of metrics um, of the population dynamics. And so our habitat degradation, we kept actually pretty minimal. So even red, I think was like 87% uh, recruitment of the wild population. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, th I think that answers your question. Am I missing something? Yeah. So you were just, so you were using a percentage of the natural recruitment to determine if the habitat was degraded. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? educational so still have any questions somebody has advanced uh should be advanced so that was not uh Thank you, Danny. It's kind of sort of set up here. Let's give him a hand one more time. Thank you, everybody.